Buongiorno. <laughs> That's a little of my Italian. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here uh, with you creative people here in Milan. So uh, I'm just really thankful to Monza for inviting me. And my wife and I were planning to be in the area and I wanted to attend a creative mornings uh, whether it be Milan or Roma, even if we don't speak the language, it would have been fun to join. And then she asked me if I wanted to be a speaker, and I said, nah, I don't speak Italian. <laughs> uh, she said, don't worry. So, to make things short, here I am. So, thank you for coming and participating in this. And shortly after, during the break, we will have some giveaways. So, if you have a business card, uh, bring it up. If you don't, scribble on a sheet of paper. And we, I have brought some wonderful pieces uh, from Oakland, the Creative Mornings chapter there. Wonderful, cool mugs. Look at that. And uh, also a variety of things that I produced for one of my musician clients some CDs and other things. Well, anyway, I better get going because time is of essence. Any wonder what is this all about? Anyone familiar with this image? If you go to Rome, this is been chiseled on the base of Trajan's column. It's about 2000 years old. And this is going to be fun. So I thought, ah, today is preserve. And so I actually, I faked that in. It doesn't really exist. But it's the font called, well, which has become known as Trajan. And um, that font was uh, probably one of the earliest examples of the use of the serif for you designers here or anyone else. So, preserve. And then that itself, in our modern world, preserve. Again, this is um, actually the, um, the adaptation by Carol Trombley. She did this for Adobe. And this is the modern variation of a 2,000 year old letter form. Anyway, I, uh, in coming to Italy, uh, I'm just amazed by how much relevance your country has in preserving everything from the arts. And here, this is partially the bust of Trajan, the emperor, whose era gave us the font, our, our modern day font, Trajan. And so uh, you have a lot to be proud of. There are countless examples of art that have been preserved, uh, wow, you know, in all the different museums. And, okay. and also you have a lot of old ancient culture, the, the Etruscans which you'll find many different uh, museums in the Tuscany area, uh, where ancient ruins and sculpture and artifacts have been preserved uh, for appreciation and knowledge. And amazing things like jewelry, which people have found very difficult to actually reproduce. And these are really tiny rings with amazing details. And uh, so in Italy also you have preservation of different type letter forms. This is in a church in Rome. And they've just put those into the walls of the foyer just to look at. You know, you have uh, various examples of Roman letter forms in Greek as well. And of course, the hillside towns that have been preserved, which are amazing walking down the streets and you have, you, wow, look at this. This is 
from the 1400s. It's, it's quite amazing to, to wander through these cities where people still live, even though they might have a, um, a uh, antenna on their roof, you know, and maybe modern conveniences like running hot water, it's still an amazing beauty in the preservation of architecture and history as you walk through these amazing places. And this is in Tuscany. So these are all recent photos I took on my trip. So this was a, a lot of fun. Ah, it's hard to see. But uh, within some of these old places, you've got floors with amazing tiles. And if you look on the right, you'll see where it's worn down. But yet, they're still appreciated. There are a couple of feet there as well. And then, what more than the preservation of salumi, right? And all over Italy, you'll find these, this delicious meat that uh, has been preserved through whatever recipe someone figured out. But uh, Italian food is amazing. And I'm thankful that you have continued to preserve the quality and uh, the flavors throughout your history. Pizza. And uh, you find this food all over the world. But coming here, I've had the best pizza. Of course, why not? We're in Italy. And then, of course, you know what that is. Gelato. <laughs> And uh, having our first real Italian gelato has been very special. And I'm glad you've preserved the quality and the flavors that are so intense and delicious. Cafe. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, I'm sure it's been difficult with the onslaught of particular American companies with a green colored person uh, invading our shores. But Thankfully, your quality is beyond measure, and um, I've been able to enjoy, even here this morning, some excellent cafe. So, uh, the word itself uh, kind of connotates different meanings. It's a verb or it's a noun. Is it a noun or it's a verb? But it's both. Its origins go back to the word observe in Latin, I believe. But the word observe is not a passive word, but it's an active word. And so as a verb, aha, there we go. A life preserver. That's my symbol for activity to keep safe from harm or injury or destruction. And also to keep safe from decomposition. You can can pickles. Uh, and you can make things out of lemons, <laughs> and, and they are lasting for a long time. Okay, that will get going there. And also, preservation of places. It's hard. This is Yosemite in Northern California, a beautiful park, which I'm thankful that they have preserved. It's a national park. You can't build roller coasters and fun rides and things like that, but it has to remain pristine for all of us to enjoy. And also preserving other parts of our world, in the oceans. So those are, those are different responsibilities that we've been given. And for myself, I look at doing portraiture as a way of preserving uh, the human character. Uh, it's just not trying to draw something that looks like someone. My attempt is to try to pull out something deeper, uh, something of, of a person's heart, perhaps. And uh, so let's see if these examples... Oh, okay. This is an early ink drawing I did for a publication. And this man, his name is William Everson, a poet, a radical who became a monk later in his life. And uh, capturing him in three stages of his life. Wow, 1975, amazing. And you've heard of Miloš, another writer. 
And so these are drawings I've done, and even the corporate work I do for annual reports, I try to pull out something a little deeper than just doing the person. Come on, program, oops, thank you. Uh, and then once while I get a commission, uh, this is the son of some friends. Uh, as a child, he's grown up now, and their daughter. And these are fun because these are actually digital. So I started off learning traditional art, and then I, with the onslaught of the Mac and better software, I took uh, the uh, a Wacom tablet in hand and started to learn how to use software like Painter, and off I go. So these are, and this is a recent piece I did two weeks ago, uh, a memorial in memoriam piece for a uh, friend of a cousin of mine uh, to honor his parents. So this is a digital drawing as well, which I just emailed to him. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And then this here is a drawing I did early this year of a cousin of mine who passed away unexpectedly in, in Hawaii, who was a well-known musician. So I wanted to preserve his likeness on his uh, memorial, uh, what is it, uh, for his celebration we had. And uh, that's Milani Bilyeu. Okay, these are going back to pencils, real pencil. So I've somewhat crossed the border, a watercolor of my wife's Uncle Bill. And this is a little different. This is a portraiture using things that reflect a person's uh, passion. And this was commissioned by the husband. And these are his wife's uh, things she loves to uh, do, to knit, to sew, make quilts. And so I did a still life portrait to reflect her using her grandmother's chair that she loves to sit in. And um, so this was an oil painting using uh, these new oil paintings that you can mix with water. Last but not least, this is Max. I, I had no idea that this chimpanzee had a name. I did this for a special exhibit in California on uh, 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 wildlife. I went to the Oakland Zoo, shot some photos of this chimpanzee, which, you know, it was looking at me and I was looking at him and and I went back, did this drawing, put it in the show, and there I met two zookeepers from the Oakland Museum, no, Oakland Zoo, and they were looking and saying, it's Max! I'm going, wow! So they actually recognized the chimpanzee from you know, the many dozens of chimpanzees they have at the zoo. And I'm going, oh wow, good. Now I'll call it Max. So that was a pastel on paper. Ah, now we're getting to a new era. I have a few photographs I'm going to show. This was taken in the 70s. Wow, that's a long time ago. Maybe some of you weren't here. <laughs> but I was in San Francisco in a place you might have heard of a place called Hayton and Ashbury, which was famous for rock and roll music uh, of that era. And there was a band playing, and I noticed this fellow um, hanging out with this big, big truck. On the other side is the stage where a band is playing. And uh, so he's the driver, and I asked him to pose. And so he was very proud of his truck, so he put his arm around it. Like, this is my buddy, and snap. And so I went back and I discovered a lot of these old photos a few months ago. And so I'm scanning them, which also includes a collection of photos of this character. I don't know if you know who Bob Dylan is. Of course you do, right? This is Bob Dylan taken 19, well, about 40 years ago. That kind of tells my age. 
And uh, so I was actually shooting photos of another musician for an article. And I was at the concert with my publisher and the other person and had my camera. And uh, I'm now scanning to preserve these images, hopefully for a show later this year or next year. And these are the women that were accompanying him. So this is fun to actually scan black and white negatives. Ooh, here we go. Okay, and more Bob Dylan. So I probably have like 60 different photographs, which I will eventually get to. Now, <clears throat> for the meat of this uh, event, I, I brought five people with me in a digital form. And uh, I interviewed them on the word preservation or preserve as well. So I'm going to let them take over. Preserve. Oh. So what comes to mind when I hear the word preserve is preservation in the sense of a verb. So when I was in elementary school, they would teach us the importance of preserving our natural environment around us, preserving the rainforest. And they taught us the three words, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And that was a way to teach us how to take care of our environment, recycling, reusing products, reducing our waste. And so all those things um, are part of our action as humanity to protect our environment for our future generations. Now that I'm older, I see the word preserve still as a verb and my part in preservation, um, but in a different light. Uh, I work with recently arrived migrants um, from Central America, most often Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and helping them transition into life in Oakland. And when I think of preserve, I think of the importance of them preserving their own culture. So, for example, many of the Guatemalans I work with have a traditional clothing that they wear, and it's called the traje in Spanish, which is suit. And there's a skirt called the corte, there's a belt called the faja, and there's a shirt called the huipil. And it's basically a beautiful colored hand embroidered blouse that the women will wear in Guatemala. And oftentimes when they come here as migrants, they, they don't wear their typical clothing because they want to fit in to the American clothing uh, tradition. And oftentimes girls will get made fun of at school uh, here in Oakland for wearing their uh, typical clothing from Guatemala. And that's, it's really sad to me because I feel it's so important to preserve your culture. And so, one of the women I work with is actually going to be wearing her traje for her graduation uh, with an organization she volunteers with. So I was really happy to hear that and to see that they're preserving their dress. And that's part of who they are. It's part of the indigenous culture that, they, that makes them who they are. And so I always encourage people to continue finding ways to express their culture and especially in a new environment where culture can often be left behind. And so I'm always encouraging them to wear their clothing and wear it proudly. Preserve. My father, an immigrant from China, was a soldier in World War II. He was a mechanic in the aircraft squadron called the Flying Tigers, who helped preserve China from a Japanese offensive from Burma. After the war, he was a small shopkeeper in East Oakland, along with my mother, his war bride, who did their best to raise five children. Unfortunately, they experienced bad health. He continued to suffer from the war with post-traumatic stress disorder. And my mother, too, experienced anorexia. And I believe it's a result of 
war trauma when the Japanese invaded her village in Guangdong, China. With both parents incapacitated, I was very anxious about my future as a child. I did not know who I was, where I belonged, or how to make a difference in the midst of a living tragedy. How I was preserved from these adverse childhood conditions and to find meaning in life, I have to credit at least three people. One was my sister, an older sister of 10 years who cared for us. I owe her a debt of gratitude forever. Two, there was a local church, a Christian group that showed interest in us young children and I became a Christian at age nine and was able to pray to a Heavenly Father who cared for me. And three, I have to credit a professor in social work at the University of California at Berkeley who invited me to tell my story in class, who listened to me to include a minority student of color, which gave me a sense of being included accepted and empowered without her encouragement and her seeing something in me. I would not have completed my master's degree in social work. These loving people preserved me and from adverse conditions and gave me a sense of purpose. I discovered my identity Answer those three questions. Who am I? Where, I? where I belong? And how to make a difference? As a psychiatric social worker, I provided care to mentally ill from disadvantaged backgrounds. I was able to transform my childhood suffering into compassion and service to others. Thank you very much. Preserve. When I first thought of the word preserve, my own heritage came to mind, having grown up in a Hindu household in India. My mother taught me everything I know about Hinduism. There were so many customs, cultural forms, festivities, all very interconnected to life. So. I thought about that because coming to the United States, there were some things that were lost in translation. And I had to go back to my roots, to come back to that sense of preserving my past. I had lost so much of it that I kind of didn't understand who I really was as an Indian and going back to those things that my mother taught me and helped preserve in me, things about my culture, um, family, and everything, really helped me regain my balance. So that's what preserve means to me, preserving my past, preserving my cultural roots and my family ties. There's a very important piece that I felt I was being called to address and that's restoring the dignity and worth and value of little kids and widows in India particularly. Because many of the orphan kids or women who become widowed in India lose their sense of identity, lose their value and are almost unseen and sometimes end up in abusive situations. So about um, 15 years ago, we joined, a group of us joined together and started a um, outreach to children, particularly orphans and widows called Little Flock Children's Home in South India. And we began taking orphan kids and hiring people who are widows as our staff so that they could become family to each other. And over the years, through our prayers, through our uh, work with the kids, giving them a beautiful place to live in and people that can nurture them, we've seen transformation in people's lives and in children's lives and it has really helped us preserve the identity with which God created them. He created them in his own image. So these children who were told they were useless or they were 
not worth anything, have come to a real sense of who they are, and we have helped preserve the real image, the true image that God created them in. You know, that they are children of worth and value, created in the image of a, you know, of a loving God, and that their future is not controlled by other people, but really by themselves. In, in the opportunities that come to them, the education that they can receive, and the healing that comes to the love and forgiveness that is offered to them in Christ Jesus. So there's so many of their lives that have been changed, and their deep sense of who they are as God created them has been preserved. I want to tell a story about two children that came to our orphanage. Both of them came because their mother was burned alive by the stepmother-in-law because the mother-in-law wanted more and more money from her. In India, they have the dowry system where women have to keep bringing money or things to their in-laws. So she burned her daughter-in-law alive and the father trying to save her died in the fire. So the children came to us traumatized and they were really afraid of the set of grandparents and didn't have anything to do with them for years and years and years. But one time, through a sense of deep sense of prayer with the child, the, the sister, who's the older of the two and who had actually seen the whole incident, received healing, and she was able to release forgiveness towards her grandparents and was restored to them when they came on a recent visit. What I like about this whole thing about preserving is that they were not forever shadowed. Something of God remained in them. And he brought back the health that he had given to them. So that sense of identity, their value and their worth and they have a future was all preserved by God and preserved through prayer. So I think that's one of my favorite stories of uh, preserving our children and ensuring that, that they have a future. Preserve. When I, when I think of preserve, I think of my grandma, who over the years have, has made lots of jams and jellies with the Meyer lemons on her one tree on the side yard. And as a result, a lot of friends and family have been on the receiving end of a lot of this wonderful Meyer lemon preserve. And I personally really love the idea of transforming a an otherwise perishable product such as a lemon or an apple into something that can then be stored and enjoyed over the course of time with family and friends and various communities. And that thought brings me to my next thought, which is one of my personal passions, making cider from apples, specifically ground steams. And I've been doing this for a few years now, and again, I like this idea of preserving the fruit in a different sense, a different way. In this case, making hard cider, which I think is really fun and exciting. So what does it mean to preserve something? When I think about that a little bit further, I think about the idea of capturing a moment in time or a snapshot, be it even a, a memory or a beverage or something edible um, that can be enjoyed. I also think of music. I'm a musician as well, and I have put out four records so far in the last 21 years. And the last one. I think it's really There's one more. We're we getting, getting close to time. We can catch it. Sounds so I have to short time um, for the question. Yeah. Such yeah. Okay. Easy, okay. Not an easy fashion, but we can we can record relatively simply these days and capture sounds, and then in a sense preserve a certain chapter or a certain memory or a certain feeling through the music. And I've always thought that's kind of a real cool, unique thing, so to speak. I also think, when I think of the word preserve, I think of self-preservation. I think about what brings, what fills our cup, what makes us whole, what brings us joy in this life, um, and essentially what preserves us, what gives us, you know, the motivation to do this or that on a daily basis. For me, again, that's from a personal perspective, working with my hobbies, working with apples and music and essentially preserving 
Um, preserving certain memories, I can put on a CD that I recorded, you know, 15, 16 years ago, and, and in a sense, it preserves that memory or that chapter of the friends in a very visceral way. Thanks for allowing me to join you today. Son of day. Preserve. The word preserve means to protect. <coughs> so today I'm going to talk about preserving my voice. Now before I do a show, I drink a little sip of tea. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, no joke is that when I started at a very young age, I was always into, like, taking care of my throat. And when I used to sing on the road with a group called Sylvester, I would never go out and party before the show. I would take a day off and no talking, which is very hard for me since I talk a lot. So through the years, that has really worked for me because at the age that I am, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, that it has worked out for me because I still am called for vocal sessions. I'm asked to do different projects with very young people, producers. And so I still, to this day, take care, try to take care of my voice as much as I can. And that entails no talking before the show. And if there are people in my dressing room, I will most definitely tell them, I can't talk right now, but after the show, I will talk to you. To help preserve my voice today, I do vocal techniques like doing the ah, ah, ah. Okay, if it wasn't just charging to that it's a, a early morning, <laughs> it, I'll warm up soon. The thing about um, preserving the voice is that it entails taking care of your body. Now, I'm a large woman, but I've been larger. And at one time, not too long ago, I found myself being out of breath a lot, and by the time or by the time I, I got up to the stage or something, you know, I was out of breath. And so now I've made a conscious effort to lose weight, and I have. I've lost quite a bit of weight. And so I feel much better. My stamina is better. And so I'm going to lose more. It's really hard, but I'm going to do it just to preserve the voice. Preserve the body as well. The type of music that I do is called dance music. Now, you might wonder, dance music? Well, dance music came from disco. And a lot of the music that I do is um, gospel intention. So um, when I was singing with Sylvester, his music was very, it was called high energy disco. But with the vocals, with us singing behind him, there were three large women that sang behind him. And he had a falsetto voice. And so it sounded like gospel music. And that's what made his music so popular. And that's what makes my music popular now. But the music changes, I, like, I guess about every 10 years, the, the music changes quite a bit. It might be a heavier bass, it might be more <coughs> drums. You know, it just depends. It might be high end or a low end. And so with gospel music, um, I sing gospel, but I'm not a gospel singer. You know, I'm really uh, a jazz. I really love singing jazz, and I really love singing uh, R&B. And I think that R&B has kind of got watered down so to speak, and so it's not true R&B. You have a few artists out there that are now doing R&B, and I'd like to do an R&B album to help preserve that genre of music. So next year, I'm going to be 
working on gospel and I'm going to be working on like an adult contemporary album. Yeah. <laughs> Some people say that disco died. Disco did not die because I'm still working. It's called Dance Now. And I'm still working. Everybody else. That's my song called Everybody Up. Okay. All right. Take a look. Whoa, what a morning. Bit of a challenge, but we, we made it. So, uh, I guess we have a couple of things. Uh, I, I'm not sure how we're going to do it with our limited time. I brought some giveaways. Um, how should we do how would you like to, to give them? Well, would you like to receive some questions and to the, to the people who ask you? Or uh, who has a business card? Everyone have a, anyone have a business card? Oh, there's one person. <laughs> oh, you win it all. No, I'm sorry. Um, let's see here. Just uh, make some questions and give them... Uh, some all right, who has a question? We'll start with the first question. Sir. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes, sir, please. Uh, in your opinion, is there uh, any relationship between preserve and the fear to lose something? Because I think, based on what you talk about in your presentation, I try to preserve something because I have the fear to lose my culture or my voice. Yes. Oh. Oh, definitely. I think the uh, uh, the preserve in its origins also deals with protection, um, and uh, it's I think a natural thing for us. Sometimes maybe it can be extreme where we maybe push people away to preserve, say, culture or what we think is best uh, within our communities. And I think the biggest challenge is how can we retain our identity, but yes, yet accept others as well. And Well, I think it can be. It, uh, I guess every country has assimilated different people, different um, cultures, which perhaps uh, has made that community stronger, um, more resilient to change because uh, we, we don't see many horse and buggies outside now, right? Um, we have uh, a lot of motor scooters and Fiats running around, small cars. And to preserve, I think, the sanity of a city compared to New York, where you've got big cars and buses or, or other areas, uh, Italy has kept things smaller, which perhaps for its own good, uh, through uh, time, uh, and technology. I don't know if that helps. You're so, can you give us a little bit on your idea of preserving humanity? Uh, well, here, here's a little quote I was going to give. I was going to quote this person and uh, the conclusion after the film. And it's actually my quote. <laughs> my short presentation, which has gone over time, <laughs> spoke to a limited representation on today's theme. I've shared things that reflect and encompass the word preserve. However, I believe our greatest challenge as humans is how we preserve each other's dignity in a fragmented world. Should we build or dismantle walls that separate us from ideas and people we disagree with? 
what is the criteria for evaluating what is worth saving? Do we love our neighbors as ourselves? Are we willing to take the time to sit and listen to each other? So, well then. All right. It's like we had a little conversation. We could go on more, you know. And let's take a couple of hours and have lunch, you know. Um, maybe we just close and uh, the people then go to you to ask questions. Maybe they. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gifts. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And definitely for our host with the delicious coffee, you get one of these. If you want, come and get it. All right. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Could we get a photo of everyone? Okay. Before you leave, this is really important. We're going to have a shot of all of us together. Yeah. Where I will. Yes, and I'm going to send that photo to Creative Mornings Oakland, where they will display it next Friday, at their uh, gathering on the word preserve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay.